Hello, everybody. This is um, the Kudan Open Lit Seminar, um, February 19, 2024. And today, it's our greatest pleasure to have Daria Grishenko from uh, the Center for Social Data Science at the University of Helsinki. We also met at the uh, Conference on Computational Communication um, from the International Communications Association in Helsinki, um, which is a nice overlap. Um, and the talk of Daria Grishenko today will be about algorithmic governance, a public perspective. And this is obviously not only interesting in terms of cultural analytics, but also more general. And as this is very, very generally interesting, uh, Daria has just been awarded an ERC starting grant for it. So we're very curious about like, what your plan and what your initial results are. So the stage is yours. We have a two hour time slot. We can use it however you want. So. Um, Typically, it's like 40 minutes talk, 80 minutes discussion, but we can, you can talk for two hours or we can discuss for two hours, whatever you like. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to speak in this speaker series and the seminar series. Uh, as already mentioned, I am a professor in digital social science, associate professor in digital social science at the Center for Social Data Science here at the University of Helsinki in the Faculty of Social Sciences. And uh, I'm trained as a political scientist. And the past few years, I have spent thinking quite intensely about algorithmic governance. And today I will share with you my thoughts, but also my ongoing a uh, project that has been uh, generally supported by the European Research Council. But let me start where it all started. Uh, here you see my uh, colleague and co-author, uh, Dr. Matt Wood. Uh, he's based at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And uh, in 2014, so 10 years ago, uh, I just defended my PhD thesis, Matt just defended his thesis. We had a dinner in Helsinki when he was visiting here for a conference. And we were trying to imagine what would be the biggest changes in our field, in the field of regulation and governance, in the next 10 years. And what we arrived at was that algorithms would probably be something really of a game-changing nature. They will change the way how public governance works. And that soon, alongside with the human governance, we will have some kind of a novel form of algorithmic governance. So 10 years fast forward, algorithmic governance is a reality in our life. For example, uh, in 2025, we expect a new uh, European travel information and authorization system to come into force. And uh, this system it will be granting authorizations to people to enter the EU. And this is meant for those who previously did not need a visa to enter in a new country. So for example, my colleague Matt, uh, once he is uh, planning to come and work uh, with me here in Helsinki in 2025, most probably will have to, if the system is already enforced, do this. So what would it exactly mean? It would mean that this ETS system will deploy a risk uh, assessment algorithm. It will connect existing databases on uh, third country nationals in the EU and deploy some machine learning techniques to devise, uh, in this case, Matt's risk profile. And then it will automatically either issue an authorization or decline uh, entry. And if uh, the decline happens, then the applicant can submit an appeal and there is a procedure for that. So uh, now we all increasingly become subjects to this uh, algorithmic governance that seem to be so novel and so, you know, out in the future just 10 years ago. When I say algorithmic governance today, what I refer to is all kinds of uses of data-driven technologies and algorithmic systems to automate decision-making and deliver public services in the public sector. Uh, and uh, in the literature today, there are terms used for this, such as... Um, governance by algorithms or AI, artificial intelligence, governance, uh, automated decision-making. There are some conceptual differences between them, but for the purpose of today's talk, I actually mean all of this. So I actually see algorithmic governance as a higher level concept that encompasses all these more specific concepts. 
And algorithmic governance has just very many faces. It can be relatively simple, such as a speed camera mounted somewhere in the street and then sending automatically a fine to those who are speeding on the road. Or it can be as sophisticated as producing some court rulings and increasingly cases in welfare policy, in migration policy, and in policing are being um, uh, processed using some form of algorithms relying on uh, big data. Uh, this whole turn from uh, data-driven but still more analog and more human-led to algorithm-led governance has naturally provoked a lot of debate and it has been met both with enthusiasm and uh, with reservations. But concerns especially started to uh, increase when we got the first scandals around algorithmic governance. So we had a scandal in Norway where people were accused of fraud, whereas they were not fraudsters. And we had a child benefit scandal in the Netherlands, which basically led to the resignation of the Dutch government in 2021 when more than 20,000 of families were wrongly accused of fraud by the tax authority who was deploying some form of algorithmic governance. So in the past 10 years, uh, research on algorithmic governance has clarified such important questions as the nature of algorithmic governance. So basically how algorithms have politics, how do they become a part of the political and also interrogated the social consequences of algorithmic governance, the social effects of uh, governing by algorithms on state and um, society. If we summarize at a very high level the work that has been done to date, the advocacy of algorithmic governance mm, roughly is based on two large lines of argument. One is surrounding the concept of efficiency. So as you can see here, uh, House of Lords could be replaced by AI bots with higher productivity. So this is the idea that we live in the times of austerity, we have fairly large governments, they cost us fairly a lot of money. Why don't we try to do something to make it more cost effective and maybe we can automate a lot of routine work of the governments make much more uh, AI-based, ADM-type decisions, so it will be just more productive, uh, more cost-efficient, more effective. Uh, and the second line of the argument, it revolves around the argument that is presented in uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, and co-author's latest book, Noise. Uh, if you are not familiar with, with this argument, so Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize together with Amos Tversky for his work on heuristics and biases, uh, explicated that there are a lot of biases in human thinking. And the next thing that he has done is also to show that there is also a lot of noise in human thinking. So noise means not simply a bias, but it means being inconsistent. And the example that features in this book is exactly the example of a judge. So there has been some kind of a study that they conducted and they have seen that judges tend to be more lenient in their verdicts after lunch, on a sunny day, and there are many other contextual factors that seem to be impactful. So it's not uh, systematic, it's random, it's noisy. And algorithms, though we know they may be biased, they are consistent, they are not noisy. So exactly in this book, this is this example about judges and saying that, well, if we would have algorithms making these decisions, then they will not be noisy. They will consistently resolve similar cases in a similar manner. How wonderful would that be? So this is the proponent side of algorithmic governance. And then, as you may know, we also have quite a strong critique of the whole idea of being governed by algorithms. And this critique, in my opinion, revolves around three main lines. The first line is the black box society type of argument that algorithms are opaque. They are not transparent. A lot of them are being developed by private companies with big tech. Then they come into government use, 
We can't really say what transparency means here. Does anyone really understand how machine learning is producing the outcomes? What's inside of the black box? How do we create this procedural transparency and accountability that is needed for the democratic functioning of a society? The second line of argument uh, exemplified in brilliant Virginia Obank's book, Automating Inequality, is revolving around the problem of inequality and bias, that uh, algorithms do not uh, de-bias our decision-making, but rather they exacerbate already existing inequalities, and uh, they are not necessarily creating a more just and more fair society, but maybe they're actually doing otherwise, and it very much connects to the problem of dirty data, to the problems of what kind of data do we use to train the algorithms, and as you know, if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. And the final line of this critical argument revolves around the line of morality, and autonomy. So do machines possess morality? What would it mean for a machine to be moral? Do we need to actually be moral in order to make uh, decisions in the realm of uh, public affairs? And what would it actually mean for those who are uh, employed in the public service? So what's the place of a frontline bureaucrat? Where is the autonomy? Where is the discretion? Uh, this line of argument also pinpoints that this basically reduces uh, a frontline worker to the rubber stamping function, just uh, looking into the algorithmic decisions, or maybe not even that. So there are different lines of attack of uh, why uh, algorithmic governance may be problematic. So let me sum up. Algorithmic governance is a new phenomenon. It describes the system of governance based on the use of large amounts of data and advanced data processing algorithms to organize human collectives, to order social life, to implement policies, to provide public services. And in the past 10 years, we have seen an explosion of research in this topic. And it looked into the social effects of governing by algorithms, both positive and negative. But what has been studied much, much less is the perception of algorithmic governance by the citizens. So what do not experts, not scholars who think deeply about those things, but rather people in the street who uh, go about their own business, what do they think about algorithmic governance? How do they see it in their current system of governance? So in the political science jargon, Basically, what we are talking about is perceived legitimacy. Perceived legitimacy can be um, defined as popular belief that the actions of an authority are appropriate and acceptable. It's exemplified in this cartoon uh, from a uh, kind of a popular um, science magazine and explanatory article on police legitimacy. If a police officer comes to you and tells you, hey, you need to come with us, uh, there are different ways of how you would react to this, depending on whether you find this request appropriate and acceptable, and whether you find police legitimate or not. So why should we care about uh, perceived legitimacy? There are at least two reasons to be deeply concerned with this topic. First is the practical dimension. Uh, we know that Perceived legitimacy reduces the cost of compliance. It allows to co-produce uh, public goods. It allows to create public value. And then there is the normative dimension to it. And that is that perceived legitimacy uh, helps in consensus building and strengthen the sense of belonging. And eventually it is just one of the core properties of a democratically accountable uh, regime or a system of authority. So we want to the, the, the regime, we want the system to be perceived as legitimate. In political science, we quite like measuring things. So we also needed to find ways as political scientists to measure perceived legitimacy. And usually, Political scientists think that it's not a good idea to go around and ask 
Do you find this legitimate? So we're trying to go around this question, not to be so blunt, but rather to ask something around the lines of, uh, are you willing to accept the decisions of this authority or do you trust this authority? Uh, do you endorse a certain institution? So I can keep towing around the concept of perceived legitimacy uh, to try to clarify whether uh, individuals find something legitimate or not. And uh, what helps us do this is to uh, consider three different dimensions of legitimacy. So on the one hand, we have the so-called input legitimacy, then we have the throughput legitimacy, and finally the output legitimacy. What do we mean by this in political science when we talk about input, throughput, or output legitimacy? Input legitimacy is the legitimacy that comes from soliciting the input into the process, into the decision-making. So we could have some kind of a direct input, such as some kind of a vote, referendum, mini publics, you name it, all kind of tools for deliberation of citizens. And we have the indirect input that comes from representative procedures. So when we, let's say, vote our representatives and then they make decisions. Throughput legitimacy pertains to the process of decision-making, to the process of governing. And uh, there we consider such features of the process as transparency, accountability, and openness. And finally, we also measure legitimacy uh, through the output legitimacy, which pertains to the effectiveness and efficiency. Are we effective in solving collective action problems? Are our services efficient? Are we delivering what uh, the citizens want and need? These are the examples of the sources of uh, output legitimacy. So how does it look like with algorithmic governance? What do we know to date about perceived legitimacy of algorithmic governance? Not awful a lot, but something. So the first work that I'm aware of that really uh, took up this question and tried to disentangle uh, the perceived legitimacy of algorithmic governance along these three dimensions, input, throughput, and output, is the work by fabulous colleagues, uh, Chris Starkey and Marco Lunich. Uh, I closely follow their work. They're fantastic raising stars of this, of this field. Uh, so what they have done is they looked into the EU context, identified these three dimensions, and uh, presented respondents in their survey experiment with different vignettes, either with a status quo human governance uh, solution, or a completely automated process or a hybrid process where there are humans and algorithms working together. And what they find is that um, this type of human in the loop, so hybrid uh, decision-making is perceived uh, equally uh, legitimate on the throughput and output dimensions as uh, a status quo type of decision-making but fully automated decision-making is perceived as less legitimate. That was in 2020 when this paper was published. And then we have a whole bunch of works from that moment on that are trying to uh, tap into different dimensions of perceived legitimacy of algorithmic governance. In 2021, Alex Ingrams and colleagues published an article. In, the, in, in, in that article, they show that AI-led decisions in public sector uh, are perceived to be lower in red tape, which is a great news, but they are also perceived lower in trustworthiness than a decision led by a human. Christoph Kern and colleagues in 2022 published an article on perceived fairness of algorithmic decision. They also discover that respondents perceive a combination of human and algorithmic decision-making as acceptable, uh, but solely algorithmic decisions were less acceptable. Waldman and Martin in 2022 published two articles, both to the same um, result, human governance of algorithmic systems enjoys higher perceived legitimacy. Uh, so you really want to include some oversight by humans over the algorithmic decisions. Magaya and the Grammar, same year, 
studied not the public service context, but the organizational context, but they nevertheless find exactly the same thing. Preferences regarding algorithms in decision making exist, uh, and the preference goes the following way. Humans should lead and algorithms should follow. And finally, just uh, a few weeks ago, we had a series of experiments in which uh, Tessa Hesworth and colleagues have reported. And uh, what they state from the series of experiments they conducted is that people clearly prefer human decision makers to remain the dominant voice in public sector decisions. So you see the pattern, right? All of these studies show us that there is a strong preference for humans in the loop. People perceive human in the loop governance as more legitimate compared to purely automated governance. But the problem is that to date, we fail to explain why people find humans in the loop more legitimate. We don't know whether these findings really hold across a variety of contexts. And we also do not know what can cause people to change their mind and to think that fully automated government governance is more legitimate than some kind of a human uh, in the loop arrangement. So right now we are confronted with what I call the human in the loop puzzle. And why is it a puzzle? because we already talked about the noisiness of human decision makers. We know that humans make biased decisions. We know that humans make noisy decisions, and yet we necessarily want them to participate in decision-making in the realm of uh, the public sector. Why? Uh, one hypothesis that I call the social identification hypothesis Mm, states that there is something very special about being human. And being human is a decisive element in building legitimacy. So algorithms cannot meet our need for social identification. They do not have empathy, neither cognitive nor emotional. And this is why we observe this lack of legitimacy. And the consequence of this hypothesis is that we cannot ever develop the same level of legitimacy. So what is very important when we are uh, installing more and more systems of algorithmic governance is to create the effective system of human oversight to somehow incorporate humans into the loop if we want the systems to be legitimate. There is also a second hypothesis, and that is what I call the novelty hypothesis. And it's more an evolutionary hypothesis, and it tells us that um, algorithmic governance is just a novel phenomenon. And the legitimacy deficit, it doesn't come from some kind of a very special property of being human, but rather just from the lack of familiarity. We don't have a social norm. We don't have some kind of a theory of mind for algorithms. We cannot model how they will behave, how well they think but just give us some time. We will develop social norms around it. We will develop expectations and we will develop our sense of legitimacy. But so far, we don't have it. Okay, from these two hypotheses, when I thought about it, it became clear to me that what we really need now is to get into the minds of individuals. We can't solve them. We can't answer this puzzle if we don't get into the minds of individuals. Because so far what we have been doing is wandering a bit in the dark and asking people, do you find this legitimate? How about this? How about that? And so now we, in a way, have a catalog of things of what people find legitimate and what not, but we don't have a mechanism of why this happens in this specific way. So, I argue that we need to start paying more attention to uh, cognition of legitimacy. We do not have at the moment in political science a kind of a solid theory uh, about the cognitive level of legitimacy. So what does it exactly mean at the cognitive level to judge something as legitimate? And also uh, Rebecca Zaxe, who is a 
rising star of uh, cognitive science in the US. She uh, recently wrote a paper on cognition of legitimacy stating that also cognitive science seems to have overlooked largely the concept of legitimacy and didn't study in great detail the cognitive underpinnings of legitimation. Um, so if we really think a bit more about how we build our ideas about legitimation at the moment, we quite soon can discover that we have some kind of a model about the cognition of legitimacy. We just never talk about this model explicitly, but the model exists. And in 2017, Tobias Lenz and Laura Viola actually published a, a paper in which they gave a name to this model and they called it the congruence model. So what is the congruence model? Uh, the congruence model is a, a very rationalist, very rational choice type of model for legitimation. Basically what it assumes is that legitimacy is rooted in uh, societal norms and expectations and that legitimacy perceptions depend on whether the actions of an entity or the decision that we are legitimizing aligns with prevailing norms, values, and beliefs. So you can imagine some kind of a, what Anderson refers to as cognitive algebra that goes on in our mind. So it's a bit of a checklist type of thing. So we can imagine some kind of mental accounting. There is a process in which we go through the checklist of what is supposed to be legitimate, kind of an ideal legitimate decision or ideal legitimate decision-making process. And then we say, well, it's accountable, yes. It's transparent, yes. It's open, yes. It's effective, yes. And then we have the score and we say, well, this is legitimate. So basically, this is how we imagine people are making the legitimacy evaluations. And this is exactly how we also ask people to answer in our surveys and our experiments. This is the model that currently, even though it's usually not being spelled out, but this is what is going on uh, in the back. Uh, but is this the right model? And in the recent years, there has been uh, a surge in research in empirical research on perceived legitimacy, not only about algorithms, but more broadly. And a lot of this research uh, produces very conflicting evidence if we assume the congruence model to be the right model that really describes what is going on at the cognitive level. So plenty of research actually cannot find support for those theoretically salient dimensions of legitimacy only find them in some cases, but not in the others. So maybe it is time to rethink how we actually think about the cognition of legitimacy. Maybe it's not the congruence model, maybe something else is actually going on. So what are the alternatives to the congruence model that we could think of? And the alternative models are the models that based on the ideas of proxy decision-making or heuristic processing. Uh, Christopher Anderson has, uh, in late 90s, studied attitudes towards EU integration and EU policies. And he found out a very puzzling thing. So he found out that the public can simultaneously be ignorant about an issue and have strong preferences regarding this same issue. So how is it possible to be ignorant and have strong preferences? He finds a very elegant solution to this puzzle. He says, well, maybe people, when they lack relevant information, they substitute their attitudes by drawing from an available pool of knowledge on the political reality. So it's the proxy decision-making. And the idea of substituting some property for another property is the idea that is captured in the research on heuristics and biases. We already talked about Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky 
And here it's also important to mention the name of uh, Gerrit Gigerenza and Peter Todd and their ABC research group. And these are the scholars, uh, psychologists, who have developed the whole idea of heuristic processing. And heuristics are these rules of thumb, those cognitive shortcuts that allow us to make very quickly decisions and they are rooted in the uh, structure of the environment. So how Gigerenza talks about them, heuristics are not logical, they are ecological. And by this he means they're not based on some kind of logical rules, so mathematical rules, they are rooted in the reality that we are experiencing. So in this uh, 2017 paper uh, by Lenz and Viola, they make the first attempt to outline what would it mean to consider legitimacy to be of a heuristic nature. And what they think about, what they theorize, is that legitimacy judgments are potentially not simply a result of actually collected information, but we filter this information through existing experiences and ways of perceiving similar situations. So it would mean that we are basing our judgments on a reference point that is available in the environment, not on some kind of an ideal, but on something that is known to us some kind of a known model. So you can think here about availability heuristic or representativeness heuristic. These types of heuristics they consider are potentially informing our legitimacy judgments. But their work has been more of a theoretical nature, so they don't do an empirical test. And uh, the scholars of whom I know who have done an empirical test uh, are Ratil and Beckerle. They just published their work like a year ago. And uh, in this work, they study how people legitimate policy choices. So it's very much about legitimacy and it's very much about perceived legitimacy. And what they find is that majority opinion is typically used as a cue to legitimate policy choices and they call it consensus heuristic. So when I uh, am asked whether I think that certain policy decision is legitimate, it is, of course, uh, of importance what I think about it personally, and if it's in congruence with my preferences, but it's not less important what the others think about it. And if I feel that there is a consensus, if I feel that the majority around me uh, are finding this decision legitimate, even if it's not in line with my own preferences, I would still rate it as Legitimate. This is what they found in their very large experiment, including five different EU countries. And they found that this consensus heuristics is uh, stronger than those theoretically salient dimensions of uh, procedural legitimacy. And this is extremely, extremely interesting. Thinking uh, along very similar lines uh, in my work, I have developed this provisional model that I call legitimation heuristic model. So at the moment, how I expect legitimacy judgments are actually being built in the minds of individuals is that we are perceiving cues that help us to uh, legitimate. These cues can relate to the input, to the throughput, or to the output. And it all happens in certain evaluation contexts. And then we deploy a certain repertoire of heuristics that help us to arrive at certain legitimacy, judgment. So we are using available prototypes, not ideal types. Uh, we use these shortcuts um, and we adapt. We adapt to the change of our environment. So once evaluation context change, once we are presented with different cues, we may come uh, to a different judgment. 
So in this way, for me, legitimacy evaluation is a process and it can be operationalized as a process in which an individual heuristically assesses cues present in their environment. And here we also potentially would need to look into the interaction between different types of cues, because this seems to be actually of high importance, which exact cues are presented and maybe even in which order they are presented. To start looking into this, uh, in the past two years, I have uh, been doing some empirical work uh, in this area of uh, legitimation and heuristics. And I will present you now some very, very preliminary evidence uh, from two experiments. The first experiment I have conducted with my uh, colleague, Matt Wood, who you already know from the very beginning of this presentation. So we have uh, conducted a vignette survey experiment in the UK, and it was staged at the airport security check. So that was a text that we presented our respondents with. And uh, in a more theoretical sense, we wanted to know not only what people thought, but also how they felt. And so that is why we made this experiment as a walkthrough experiment. We generated some pictures and we uh, presented our respondents with a kind of a walkthrough. Okay, you arrive at the airport and then this happens, this happens, and that happens. And then we asked them how they felt in this process, but also we asked them whether they found that it was um, trustworthy, uh, efficient, fair, and whether it was regulatory appropriate. Mm. The reason we wanted to check in with their feelings is uh, because there is uh, a theory that feelings can be used as independent input in the process of uh, social judgment. And it's called heuristic theory of emotions that has recently been formulated by uh, Jagetti. Mm. In a nutshell, the idea here is that emotions are employed as mental shortcuts to detect evaluative properties. I give you an example. Let's say you experience an emotion of fear and this emotion can be used as a shortcut to assign a property of being dangerous. You're walking in the forest and you see a spider. The spider provokes fear. Now you can from this feeling of fear make an evaluative judgment about this spider and you assign this spider a property of being dangerous. But this may be a completely uh, harmless spider, but you already made uh, an evaluative judgment based on your emotion. And to get the argues we do it all the time. Let's say we feel guilty and we typically use guilt as a shortcut to assign a property of being wrong or let's say we feel angry and we typically use the feeling of being angry as a shortcut to indicate that we are targets of aggression or hostility. So this theory postulates that emotions are not the only game in town, but they actually do play a role and they generate independent input in our evaluation. So in our experiment, what we have done is that we uh, told our respondents that they arrive at the airport. And then in the control group, they just went through a normal security check. And in our treatment groups, uh, we suggested that uh, the security check has been completely automated. So there have been no human officers anymore. The whole process is just screens and some kind of robots and very, very futuristic uh, scenario. And then uh, in one of them, it was uh, it has featured a lot of procedural information and feedback loops. And the other one was uh, very minimal on the information that the process gave throughout uh, the security check. And at the end, all of our respondents were faced with a mildly negative or inconvenient outcome. So we fixed the, neg the outcome as negative. 
they all um uh, it, it takes very long time to go through this security check. So at the end, they can't go shopping. They can't go have dinner. They barely miss, uh, they, they almost miss their flight. So very unpleasant situation that we're trying uh, to make them imagine. And then we ask them whether they found it, uh, uh, it was acceptable, whether they found that it was trustworthy, how the whole uh, issue was handled, whether they think it's the best way to, to go about it and so on. So what do we find? Something actually very important, uh, and in our view, it's the evidence in support of uh, heuristic theory of emotions. What we find is that negative emotions were routinely associated with lower ratings of legitimacy and its theoretical components. So the angry respondents, or those who self-reported feeling angry, feeling dissatisfied about the whole process, they will routinely rate uh, the process low in legitimacy. They would say it's not, it's less fair, it's less uh, trustworthy, it's less efficient, everything. And at the same time, those who felt neutral, they didn't find it was particularly annoying or uh, inconvenient, uh, they would give much higher evaluations of legitimacy and individual components of legitimacy. But at the end of the day, what we also find, and it's not surprising, is that uh, in our human in the loop scenario, in our status quo scenario, we in general would always find higher legitimacy rating than in our automated cases. So we actually found even further proof of what everyone else is finding there is a strong preference towards humans in the loop, but our additional contribution here is to actually look into how we um, generate this judgment. And it seems that uh, emotions or these kind of negative feelings, they do correlate strongly with our perception or with our report on whether we perceive it as legitimate or not. So at the end of the day, it seems that there is some kind of heuristic input going on. And then the second study that I have just conducted very recently, and I'm like literally in the middle of analyzing this data, but there are some preliminary findings that I can share with you. This uh, was a factorial experiment uh, in Finland and uh, on the topic of protective policing. So I was asking Finnish uh, residents about acceptability of using algorithms for profiling risky individuals or spaces and using data-driven insights for policing. And preliminary findings show that there are no consistent preferences. In other words, people find it really difficult to think about various theoretical dimensions of legitimacy, in this case of predictive policing, but at the same time, we do see that theoretically relevant proxies, such as whether these uh, people, our respondents, whether they find um, that technology is a great solution for various policy problems. So this was one battery of questions that I was asking. Then there was one that was measuring trust in state institutions. And then there was one that was measuring surveillance attitudes and how sensitive they were to privacy issues. So these proxies, they were very consistently uh, explaining legitimacy evaluations of their respondents. So it seems that when you ask directly about the specific dimensions of um, perceived legitimacy, it's very difficult for people to wrap their head around it, but they do seem to use proxies in order to evaluate the whole situation. So again, back to the Anderson's uh, insight, you may be ignorant and yet have preferences. And in order to do this, you just can use proxies. So the future outlook, what's next on the agenda? As I already mentioned, in the next five years, I will have the privilege to engage deeply with this research topic, thanks to the generous funding from the European Research Council. And I'm currently building an interdisciplinary team here in Helsinki to first develop more rigorous methodologies and then uh, to uh, 
formulate theories that would help us to explain how legitimacy judgments are created and changed in the minds of individuals when they encounter algorithmic systems that govern their lives. So hopefully in five years from now, I will have more precise answers to the questions how exactly people judge whether a system of algorithmic governance is acceptable and proper, what helps people make up their mind, and what could change their beliefs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, so yeah, we were all silent listening and like sort of um, coming up with interesting questions. I assume there's already two hands up, which is Mila Oliver, a cultural historian, and uh, Mikhail Tom, who's a may I say socio physicist now, <laughs> physicist. Uh, I also have a bunch of questions. So um, anybody else, please uh, sort of prepare your questions. So Mila. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, I guess so. Okay, great. Um, yeah, super interesting. Uh, I have actually several questions, but I I will ask my first question now. Um, I was wondering, um, well, my assumption is that uh, there are not many data sets that you could use for studying um, kind of like algorithmic governance as such and, and kind of like people's reactions to them, basically, I, my, I assume that many of these systems are, you know, it's, it, it can be difficult to access them. But I, I, I was just um, wondering that, um, have you been thinking about what would be kind of like a perfect, if you would uh, try to um, study this in, in data-driven, uh, you know, from the data-driven approach, what would be kind of like a perfect data set for you and, and what types of um, kind of like data points would you need uh, in order to, to kind of like um, quantify what is being, uh, you know, kind of like a uh, perception of, of legitimacy and um, kind of like what would be the minimum, um, minimum information that you would need in order to be able to to study this in in data driven way. Yes, thank you, Mila. Um, well, obviously, this is the question that concerns me a lot because uh, I need to somehow do this research and I need to find the best ways of um, finding solid evidence. And you're right; there is not really um, a data set that we can fetch from somewhere. So we need to get a bit creative about it. I think that a, a, a large part of it would be uh, generating our own data. But now the question is how exactly, what kind of data? And then there are several questions here that do require slightly different approaches. So first of all, we just need more evidence that people do use heuristics, right? So that, yeah, that, that legitimacy evaluation has a heuristic nature or under which conditions does it have heuristic nature? And in order to do this, potentially um, fairly um, typical methods could be deployed from, you know, just surveys. But also I'm thinking more and more about uh, the wealth of methods that has been developed by scholars of human-computer interaction and potentially looking into what do they already know because they study usability of systems, they study how people interact with different kind of virtual systems and virtual agents. So what can we learn from them? It, it's one of the first questions that I have now on my agenda, understanding better uh, what is out there and what is uh, useful for a political scientist in their toolkit. So that's the first part. And the second part is, uh, in general, uh, so far, the study of heuristics has been something that psychologists do. And psychologists typically run experiments. This is their go-to method. So they develop a hypothesis. They think that this is how it potentially should be. And then they design an experiment that can test this specific hypothesis. And then they either find uh, support or they don't find support for their hypothesis. And this is definitely uh, something that we should consider in this project, running experiments. And this is what I was thinking about. 
But at the same time, I'm quite interested into looking what are other ways of studying heuristics. And maybe we can look into more um, uh, cultural methods. Maybe we should look into what uh, cultural anthropologists have done. Because I understand that they have studied quite a bit of this. They just use, don't use these terms. They don't use these names. But the whole uh, wealth of research, let's say, on prestige in different societies and what are the markers of prestige? How do you know that something is prestigious? Well, it, these questions are actually very tightly related to what I want to study. So in a way, this would be also very interesting to try to find this thick data and these accounts and potentially use some data mining in order to try to find what are these cues and extract them from, from texts. Mike. Okay. Uh, well, I, first of all, thank you very much. It was very interesting and thought provoking. Number two, I should make probably at the start of my question a caveat that I'm your, in a sense, your client, because I find uh, on emotional level, I find the, 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 the whole idea of algorithmic governance not just illegitimate, but simply horrifying. Uh, uh, and it, so, so please keep in mind that, that all the less uh, 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 I was going to say might be might be um, caused by an irrational emotion I have. Uh, but anyway, uh, it seems to me that there is sort of an elephant in the room, which is which is which is in this in this whole story, which which you somehow somehow didn't mention which is basically the question of responsibility. That uh, whenever we imagine the, the, the situation of sort of Kafkaesque nightmarish bureaucracy, what we are thinking about, we are thinking about a system when you, when you go to one uh, bureaucrat and he makes some sort of a formal decision following some sort of arcane rule but but which is which is just forwards you to some other person who does it also and, and then it's it cycles out and nobody's responsible and nobody's making decision so it seems to me that 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 for for system to work it must have feedback loops and feedback loops in the system which we uh, know at least are based on personal responsibility Okay, judges are biased, but in principle, a, ro a wrongly behaving judge is held uh, can be held under uh, uh, can be held accountable. If a self-driving car hits a, a pedestrian, who is responsible for that? Is it a person who is sitting in the car, or is it the a uh, person who created algorithm or somebody who tested it and and where do we go to 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 improve the system and what is the mechanism behind it and just to illustrate it for example in your experiment with with uh, thought experiment about the security checks i mean uh, 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 the the bad case scenario in my in my understanding is not that I'm uh, I don't have time to drink a coffee. The bad case scenario is that some object in my luggage is found and is considered uh, unallowed or response uh, uh, or uh, unacceptable. And in, in when when I understand what happens with a human in the loop, and uh, then we can sort of interrogate. We can. We can have some sort of conversation. We can discuss, he, and he makes an informed decision, which might be one day or another. And here, what happens? I have no idea. And that is exactly what makes, in my view, this this system legitimate. Please react to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree with you that accountability seems to be the, the key word here. There is one um, Norwegian philosopher of technology uh, who wrote a wonderful piece a couple of years back that was called A Shallow Defense of uh, uh, Algocracy or something like this. Uh, 
And so his point was exactly going point by point of all the criticism of algorithmic governance and saying, well, but isn't it the same with human bureaucracies? But isn't it the same? So he makes a wonderful points, you know, starting from uh, empathy and saying, well, a bureaucrat does not necessarily need to possess much empathy. So uh, how is that different, right? And so until he arrives at the point of accountability, saying, well, here we actually do have a problem. Uh, and on the one hand, yes, but then what would be very interesting, I think, to look into is, let's say we can, uh, at the moment, take your example with self-driving car, this is really a bit of an open question, but we could, technically speaking, have a legal agreement, we could regulate this. We could assign a responsible for this. We could have a law that says that the developer of technology is responsible. So we can actually pinpoint this person, right? Because there is a person somewhere in the loop. It's just depending where is that person. Yeah, yeah but, but, but the question is whether it will work or not. So, so we, we uh, there are different uh, ways of resolving this pro 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 problem, which are not... Uh, uh, not equivalent one to another, and we, we don't know yet which is the best one, and that's the problem for us, at least for now. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But then what is really interesting is that, let's say we could find a, a solution, and we can fix it regulatory, and mm -hmm. once we have done this, would that change our perception or not? And this is where it gets actually really interesting. So let's say we have this new social norm, and this is where I come back to these two hypotheses. So let's say we now have a social norm. We know who is responsible. This accountability gap has been closed. Does it help us or are we still feeling something is missing? How do we actually get about it? How do we get to this what is there? And for me, it is to opening up the black box of cognition of legitimacy because this really is very little studied. It's a very interesting topic. Um, uh, let me say that I'm a very technical person. Uh, I'm, I'm a computer science, and I, I don't know if you know the case of Fujitsu and the post office in the UK. Um, do you know that there was prosecuted 900 post office in the UK with a mis um, basically a buggy software on Fujitsu uh, telling them that they were stealing money from the post office in the course of 10 years? The horizon. Um, no, no, no. Horizon scandal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called the British Post Office scandal. Horizon scandal. Yeah, and, and Fujitsu was the company who did the software, and, and they were prosecuting 900 of actually similar position on post office, claiming that they were stealing money during 10 years, and no one uh, like uh, could basically uh, assess that the problem was the software. Everyone was just blaming the people. And, and just this shows that if there is a, a new dimension here and it's a big elephant in the room and it's this complexity of the algorithms. And you were saying about, oh, then we will find responsibility in a car right now, let's say Tesla, uh, we, the number of algorithms are endless. The number of algorithms that are there is endless. And the companies who interact in this, in this um, I mean, once I was flying with a company that does just the with mirrors of looking back that now has sensors and software. Um, and, and if the problem is the, this, the, um, this, is this um, blind spot that you, you don't see, that might be the one who you can uh, blame. But I mean, there is many um, kind of problems that can emerge in a very complex system like this. And the post office show, and, and the, actually the problem is that, for example, the justice system is not prepared for this. Like this judge that they, uh, like for example, I come from Spain, um, that most of them in the higher court came from the Franco times, where, where we had the dictator, and they are in, illiterate on these kind of topics. They will be not able to rule on these things. And, and, and that's a huge problem. They will not understand what is a pack in a software. Uh, they don't understand the complex issues that come on from there. And even the people who assess this, they are uh, on, te on technical level, they might miss a lot of points. And, and, and that shows just that, I mean, this software of Fujitsu in the post office was an accounting software. Just basically they were 
some complex issues that they were basically erasing numbers uh, in some in when when there were some concurrent um, uh, transactions com coming on. And if they couldn't find this in 10 years, I'm a little bit cautious. Like they will solve other issues right now, um, talking about AI and black boxes and how to assess an LLM, a, a large language model um, that is much more complex. If, they, if, if in 1890s, there were 10 years to fix this problem of, of like 900 people, 900 people being, being prosecuted, like not in, not in one year, but just like in a quarter of several years. And, and yeah, I mean, this, I mean, this algorithmic uh, governments, uh, when it comes to be responsible, that we have a long work. Like now, I don't know if you saw this, this, uh, this week, uh, there has been in Canada a problem with the, the airline uh, chatbot uh, that had promised something to the customer. And now apparently uh, they will need, because they fire all the customer, uh, half of the customer department, like to reply the complaints of customers and, and it promised some kind of honor refundable thing and then now they need to actually do it uh, because they say like well you you fire half of the uh, customer team now now you have an LLM doing the job the LLM did and, and to me happened something similar last year here in Estonia where I actually tried to purchase um, a printer that I found very cheap in a, in, in a store like one of the more, more known stores here in Tallinn is Arbutitak, that is like smart, a smart uh, computer, basically, in Estonia. Um, and, and I found really cheap. And then they said, no, no, this was an error. And it's just like, what? How this is an error? Like, uh, it's not an error. You, 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 you make a system that told me this is the price, then, and when I paid everything and you need to ship me, then you say it's an error. Um, uh, these kind of things will come, I think, more and more. But I mean, well, in my case, I was disappointed. But... Um, in other cases, might lead to more things, um, and I think this, this, yeah, this, this has a lot of dimensions. That uh, it's not only what, um, if like I had also an experience like um, Michael saying, in I am an artist also. One time I was in 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 the airport of Barajas, is the bigger in Madrid, and I had an artwork. And I enter as soon as I, I saw in the, I, I mean, basically I was late and I entered one artwork into the, basically it was not a hand luggage, it's supposed to be check-in. And, and it looked like a bomb, basically. Like when I entered into the into the um, scan, I saw everyone was looking like this. But immediately, just to put short, in less than two minutes, I had the head of Barajas um, in there, uh, the head of security of Barajas. And I, I just explained what it was. And he believed me and I could enter. But um, if this how much we trust in algorithms, and the algorithms will say this is a bomb, then everyone kind of like rely on the algorithm and rely on them less in themselves. And that, that might be the problem that we can lead in the future. Um, that they rely more than algorithm than other, other, other um, things. And, and we need to train everyone in this direction that just the algorithm is just one factor or one dimension, but then there is a human one that needs to be also even more important than algorithm. And, and that might be leading a lot of problems. They say, ah, oh, I don't know. And the algorithm says this is like a bomb. And I just like, um, you, you will go to an output check or, or something. And, and that, that, is the, that is more or less what happened with the post office uh, case scandal. They were saying the software is saying you stole the money. In fact, they didn't steal anything. It just, they were like, the, the money was there, but it's just like um, the system was saying that they stole money. Um, and, and that is just like my comment into, into this. The thing is, the mention that needs to be taken in account, but I don't see it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for, your um, for the whole package, and also thank you, uh, the three people who questioned before. So I have a, a quite foundational sort of thought. Um, that developed while we were sort of introducing all this. And one of the interesting things is that these PRC projects are go-to panels, right? And so uh, as such, they need to survive very specific period. And uh, what's quite interesting in this literature is there is particular streams going on, which I think uh, there is, particularly in the case of Kahneman and, uh, you know, sort of one half of the way of 
But there is a kind of like authority by seniority policy going on, uh, where they, they are too famous for what they're saying. And so the last uh, the intervention by Mar that you know algorithms are fundamentally uncertain. It's not true. It's simply not true that humans are uncertain and algorithms are not noisy. It's yes. I, I happened to be at the first introduction of this book, and I, I, I was the whole talk, I was thinking this. And the same with the nudging book, where I also happened to be in one of the first introductions. And I thought, like, wow, this is like, this is really awful. Like, if this pans out, like, good night. I mean, you know, this is not like how it works. And so I think there is a kind of interesting um, direction we can go from what you put on the table. If we think about these foundations, and I think that could be in the hiring process of your interdisciplinary team, maybe it would be possible to put something together which really has not been there. And I think the root here is in Giga Lenser's concept of heuristics as ecology. And because, you know, for those who, who are not so familiar, Giga Lenser is, you know, fundamentally super familiar with with the foundations that go into all of this. Um, complexity science, cognition a la Helmholtz, uh, environment concept a la Uxquil. So this idea of like the second question of what we call Tom was the feedback. One thing I found sort of symptomatic that in the literature that you cite, there is a feedback loop between cognition and the world, like a cognitive entity or an agent and the real world. While Giger answer makes clear that there is no such thing as a division between the human and the world, but the ecology includes the human. Uxkill, and he makes very, very, very explicit reference to that. Like he, he literally says, like, this is the case, what I just said. And then he says, like, as Uxkill already said. So Uxkill has this concept of a uh, Wirkungskreis, which is a feedback loop, uh, but actually means. Um, functional circle. And that functional circle is actually not one feedback loop, it's two. So there is a there is this cognition verbal feedback, while at the same time there is a second feedback between the cognitive agent, which is just a point, and the imagination of the world. So this is a really interesting thing because as like in this room, there is a bunch of humans, every single one of them as a feedback loop between what they perceive and what they imagine the world to be. And then the real world changes and the others can update not only their, their perception of the real world, but also how other people will perceive it. So now we're in a situation where we have to say, okay, so the environment is a whole bunch of cars and agents that do something. And uh, now in this process, if we have computers, Algorithms, what are they doing? You're, you're, you're characterizing them with input, throughput, output. So basically, they're also cognitive agents. That's a really interesting thing. So basically, we have a system of cognitive agents that have an input, like they see something, they think about it, and they have some output in the real world. And now, this is sort of where we become really foundational. Input, throughput, output reminds us of something which is super foundational in the theory of communication, which is the so-called noisy channel in the theory of communication by Claude Shannon in 1949, figure one. And I don't have evidence for it, but I'm pretty sure the medium is the message by Marshall McLuhan, by, by McLuhan actually sort of refers to that figure, to that thing. So here's the thing, throughput is always noisy. And that is like what Mark also sort of indicates. We wouldn't have error correct correction mechanisms in computers all over the place if there was certainty and if computers really were like you know science fiction authors and broad audience people think since the 1950s, they would be. But the big problem is actually indeed in the signaling, they are super, super noisy. They are super, super uncertain. Actually, um, sort of um, either answer after the after this. Uh, explanation where he sort of like, you know, explains the situation in relation to Kahneman and so on. He says, uncertainty is inescapable. That is a really interesting. So obviously we must teach people 
who do this kind of research, who vote for people, who use this algorithms, who build this algorithms, that both people and algorithms have biases. Some of them may be predictable, others may be not. What Mike said, this kind of accountability issue, I can put somebody to jail. I cannot put the Tesla car to jail. They just ran over my grandma, right? Nobody, like the decoupling of, of accountability, I think, is a really big issue. In, I mean, this is like obviously constructed often in, in, in corporations. You know, you, just, you have things like you, you call 50,000 people in the corporation, nobody's guilty. And then, you know, you can they, you can't do anything. So now there's another component which is related to this shared theory of communication, which is algorithms themselves are communication. So the interesting thing is the master thesis of closure, which is about circuit diagrams, makes this fundamentally clear. There is computers are circuits where there is electricity flow. That is like you put something in, you put something out, there's uncertainty in between. So this is not, un, it's not only not unrelated, it was developed by the same person. And so that means, I think that's where we need to go back to. We need to take these things serious. We cannot like live with theories that are two, three hops away from these kind of foundations. And I think that is a quite interesting thing because it feeds back, unintended, to giga answers heuristics. Because that basically means the whole system is dependent on a heuristic, which takes me to my last point, which I think is another extension you could make. We talk about cues. So there is, and this is interesting, in your figure, you have a cue, then you have the input through the output thing, you have a heuristic, and then you have some kind of litigiousness and judgment. So there is an input, which is your cue, and an output. Now, one of the interesting things is cues work in discrete world. Like a cue is literally some discrete thing, while a heuristic is fundamentally not necessarily discrete. Actually, you know, we're, we're basically these glorious an, uh, analog computers that run in a little bit of protein in each lunch of a little bit of swap materials. But there is like 80 billion oscillators in our brain that don't fire, but predominantly oscillate. So the, the, the fun thing here is like once we realize that the interaction with the real world can be something like Walter Rowe, the famous rally driver, figured out. I could drive a car one and a half times faster than the other person once I realize I have to take a curve, not like driving a car, like I'm learning driving school, but like skiing. Like all my neurons, all my perceptions in the continuous movement, and it's all a control uh, that is sort of like continuous. And now here's a question. I, 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 honestly, this is one of the biggest questions I have in my life. We live in a world that is fundamentally classified in categories. We have laws that are written down, usually in paragraphs and articles. So they come in discrete format. We classify the world. If you can, like if you cross the street, you don't do the laws or else you walk when it's green and you don't walk when it's red. So you can take a cue. But actually, while you're walking, you have to take continuous decisions. Like for example, there may be gravel or ice or whatever. So 95% of the time, we actually have to take continuous decisions and these classifications and these pre-cues don't play a role at all because the algorithm is fundamentally analog, it's fundamentally multi-channel, and it's fundamentally not following any laws other than physics. And so like, the key question is, how do we bring these two things together and save ourselves from, from nudging and really stupid theories that sort of like, don't take into account this foundation. I think this is like, I mean, you're in a fantastic situation, right? You get one and a half million euros to tackle this problem. But it's, it's like, at the same time, I don't envy you because this is really, really hard because it's so hard for going to the foundations. It's amazing. So, so, so this is maybe, you know, I don't expect that you answer what I just said, but maybe you can give us a little glimpse of like, who are you going to hire to tackle this problem? Yes, thanks a lot, Max. So, uh, in fact, you, you grasp it very correctly. I mean, from the very beginning of my career as a political scientist, I was not happy with the rational choice as uh, 
the basics for basically any kind of theory, any kind of concept in political science. And it was obvious to me that this just doesn't work. And I understand that all models are wrong, but some are useful, but that was wrong and not particularly useful in my opinion. <laughs> so I spent uh, some time and it took also some courage to, to say, well, look, let's get rid of the rational choice. At least let's take one concept that I find exciting and important and that's the concept of legitimacy and let's take the rational choice out of legitimacy this implicit assumptions this idea of cognitive algebra and if we take them out what is in there right so we need then an alternative model and yes i did read the gigarinza uh a few years back and i got really fascinated you know how he goes back to simon and uh this is exactly what informs this whole project okay let's let's throw this out this rational choice uh rubbish and put something else instead well for the best that i could find at the moment is the ecological rationality theory so this is how i built this case right and now the question is how do i study this empirically and this, uh, this is a huge uncertainty in this project. This is the big risk. This is the high risk dimension of this project. So if we manage to tackle it, then there will be the high gain that the ERC is after. And if we are less successful, we'll still generate interesting and novel insights, but maybe we will not be able to really move the needle when it comes to finding an empirically sound way of integrating ecological rationality as the basis into the study of the one of the foundational concepts of political science that is legitimacy. But we have five five years to try to do this. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, actually, re related to this feedback loop uh, conversation that we have been having and also referencing to uh, why this, um, kind of like this, um, you know, emotions uh, related to, to uh, algorithmic governance. And, and, uh, and, and I think that this um, fear of losing possibility to influence somehow the decisions, uh, you know, that concern you. Um, I, I just started to think that usually, oftentimes, um, Algorithmic governance comes also with certain types of uh, digital interfaces that require people to not to discuss with people, but to maybe uh, put some of the data somewhere. And uh, of course, uh, in the society, there are people who are more proficient uh, in using digital tools uh, and, and others who are maybe not such. So, so this, um, I, I was just wondering, have you been thinking of, of kind of like looking at um, how different, well, well, groups of uh, citizens, for instance, or, or different types of citizens kind of like try to benefit or kind of like lose, feel that they lose some kind of like control um, with the uh, introduction of algorithmic governance. It might be that somebody who is who is not very talkative or, or very good in social terms might feel that it's it's somehow easier to communicate with uh, digital interfaces, uh, while for others it can be the other way around. So so I just wanted to uh, kind of like uh, have you been thinking about this kind of like di different types of uh, how algorithm governance uh, affects different. Um, groups of citizens overall. Yes, yes, of course, that's uh, that's very much at the core of what we're going to do. So to reveal some of the details, this European Travel Information Authorization System is the case that we actually want to study. And one of the interesting things about it is that we can, we can try to work together with various respondents, with various people who potentially could be affected by this system uh to to help to, to ask them to help us to construct and deconstruct the legitimacy of the system so using more qualitative approaches uh, and here it's very crucial to look uh into those different 
so to say, risk profile. So people who may expect that they may, you know, get the, the risk profile alert, but also those who may feel that they are absolutely not having anything that may yield them as risky individuals, but would then nonetheless be considered risky. And so to, to interrogate their feelings and their emotions and their kind of um, uh, justification strategies of how they understand it and how they see it, right? Because this is where it gets very interesting when you get, um, when the, the ATIAS, at least how it has been imagined and conceived by the EU, we don't know what the exact implementation will be. And we most probably cannot access the real system and interrogate it because it's in the area of security and uh, migration control, which is not an easy area to study, as we all know. Uh, but nonetheless, the way how it has been, um, what we know from the documents that exist to date, is that it would, in fact, uh, pull a lot of different information, a lot of different databases that have never been interrogated jointly before, and it will try to, to use uh, machine learning techniques to learn from this data who are those risky individuals and try to profile them so that any new incoming individual can be then assessed against this, uh, this algorithm that is developed on the basis of existing data. So we get obviously into the questions of what is this existing data, uh, how reliable is this data, how biased is this data, what are the additional rules that are being put on top and so on. So th there is a lot that will be going on in that respect. But we definitely need to look into very different groups of people. And primarily for me, the starting point here is to look into uh, who are the individuals who consider themselves that this system would be problematic for them. They, they are um, anticipating to be considered risky, no. but also playing a little bit with the idea. And what about those individuals who consider that they by no means have any kind of potential risk profile? And what if they would get some kind of a mm, highlight there? How would they go about it? How would they justify it? How would they understand it? And just how would they parse this whole situation for themselves? So I, I do think we're in a situation where we talk about a system global, it's too possible. Like if you say you want to use artificial intelligence, they want to use artificial intelligence. Um, there is a lot of like as Benjamin Netanyahu said a couple of years ago, there is billions in the security industry. And so people will be very happy to automate it because they will learn more of this less work. Now, if we take a step back and say, Okay, so what is actually the utopia, not the dystopia, of algorithmic governance? Um, I think if you go a little bit back and say, okay, we're not talking about human computer interaction, we're talking about human institution interaction. We, right? we, we, we're actually asking a state or country if you can actually enter the country. So we have lots of human institution interaction that fundamentally feels a lot like human computer interaction. Actually, I worked in an uh, art library which was housed in the building that formerly had, was basically the uh, party center of uh, the central um, administration of the NSDAP, the Nazi party of Germany. And that building is built like a database, like literally. There is like a the office that runs all throughout a very long hallway. There's like card index uh, remnants and uh, of stuff like that. So the whole building was supposed to actually provide these kind of services that we now with the computer. And it's the same problem. You put something in, there is some throughput and you have some app, which I've just watched Derek Terry Gillings was saying what could go wrong, right? So that kind of thing. So now what is the utopic version of this? So People, for example, criticize the presence of Intuit, TurboTax, in the American tax system. Two thirds of people, whatever I don't know the exact number, use TurboTax to actually prepare their tax form. Now, why do people do that? The reason is because Intuit did an absolutely fantastic job to actually mimic the kind of interaction you have with somebody sitting behind the booth. 
And it's very, very cheap as long as you just check boxes and you're a standard case. But at any given moment, you actually have the option. It's like, okay, I'm gonna pay 20 bucks and I actually talk to a real person really quick. So the key thing is we have these systems in the world that are already good versions. Actually, they're better than if you walk to some kind of like a regular person who may not be familiar with your specific case because uh, you may be the mother of somebody coming from a different country, like, you know, there's 10 cases in the US, but they will still be able to divert you to like specialist who's a specialist. So that kind of stuff, you said is something that is ultra hip and is ultra necessary as well. Like how necessary you can see in the beginning and onset of the pandemics, a lot of students, uh, university where I uh, taught at UT Dallas were working for each other and they were talking for 60, they were working for 60 hours a week because this kind of stuff needed to be developed. So the question is, do we do this kind of research in order to automate more or to make the world a better place? Should the European Union be a place that has better interaction of humans amongst each other, of humans with their institution, or should it be a place that sort of like has more efficient algorithmic developments where people are sort of brushed over? And so I think there is that you are in a sort of unique situation where you can make that happen, you can make that point. But I think you should take into account that actually there is this other side where we actually don't want to get rid of this human factor, but we want to probably build systems that have the human factor both automated and unautomated as a principle. And there, I think it would make sense to look at examples like YouTube, for example, and see where this is applied, because right now you're looking at examples that are future. There's not even data for this at the time, for example. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the whole idea of, you know, confronting, uh, so con construction and deconstruction, utopian versus dystopian, and understanding these various uh, imaginaries is extremely important in the framework of this project. But at the same time, mm, I'm a bit of a early modern person at the bottom of my heart. So I believe that we can uh, generate evidence first and then present it to the public and to the decision makers and say, well, this is what we managed to find out. And now it would be really time for some democratic deliberation. So what do people actually want? How do people want to be governed if they knew the, the whole story and not just the part of the story or have kind of very raw arguments. And uh, recently there has been a series of, I think also very interesting experiments. Uh, so one thing about surveillance, you know, use of surveillance in public places, state surveillance, uh, it has really taken off in, from the 1980s. And you may have heard of this surveillance consensus that mainly in all the countries, people actually find it completely okay to be surveilled. And also in, in my recent work, whenever I include a question that is formulated, something like, uh, how do you feel about surveillance in public places to increase uh, public safety, obviously in the name of some kind of public good, you would have basically 80% of people saying strongly support, right? And it doesn't matter in which country you do it. Would you do it in the UK? Would you do it in Sweden or would you do it in Finland or would you do it in Kazakhstan? You would get basically the same numbers. Now, uh, my colleagues in Germany, Michael Rochlitz uh, and uh, David Carver, they have uh, done an experiment where they, uh, in the control group, they basically asked some, some sort of this question. And then in their uh, treatment groups, they were presenting people with evidence of what can actually be done with this surveillance data. And as you can imagine, once you inform the public of what are the opportunities that open up for the state, they get much more reluctant about the fact that surveillance in public places for public safety is such an unproblematic and, and great thing. So just presenting people and, you know, not saying you will be a target of this, but just say, just saying, you know, this is also possible. This is what we can do. We have real time AI algorithms for face recognition, and then we can do X, Y, Z. And then we get uh, much lower support 
for these technologies. So I think one important piece of it is also just to maybe measure where are we in terms of public opinion and uh, what happens if the public opinion becomes more informed. Right, so that would be also an important an important angle to come from. Mike. Yeah, well, one just tiny comment about what Max just said is basically Max looks to me that Utopia actually is a well functioning human in the loop. And I think actually <laughs> nobody nobody begins that. That is more or less I mean, of course there are possibilities of improving it and nobody would want to have a uh, security check at the airport without any scanners or whatever, just like do done from start to finish like and, you know. uh, and uh, one more thing I just wanted to, to, to throw in one example which oh, at least I find it it, it, it actually resonates to with with uh, uh, the question of how people feel about, about sort of losing their agency. Uh, and, and I can say I completely understand how it works. The, the case in question is uh, voting digitally. Uh, uh, at least in Russia, uh, it was argued that, that the, the huge difference is uh, that whenever you have a sort of paper ballot system of voting, uh, any person with reasonable intelligence and, uh, well, probably high school diploma or middle school diploma uh, can go to, to uh, can in principle go as a, as a, as a an observer of the polling station and his intelligence and, and knowledge is enough to check what's going on and whether it is working or not. Uh, but uh, if you introduce some sort of even extremely open, even, even uh, with completely open algorithms and everything, uh, the system of, uh, of uh, electron voting with blockchain and whatever, you have a small set of, of people with uh, uh, IT education and, and, and specializing in this sort of thing, maybe I don't know, half percent of population or whatever, who are actually able to check what we're going on and understand how the system works and validate that it's done. Uh, and uh, it sort of automatically makes it discredited. That is sort of one argument uh, I have uh, heard and I sort of relate to it. On the other hand, there is an empirical argument that in uh, Estonia, uh, digital voting exists for a long time. Um, last time, more than half people voted frankly and it's uh, trust to this into the system seems not to be an issue. So it is it's sort of interesting how it functions and probably might be interesting. I don't know, just for the enemy. I don't know whether you want to react to it. Right. right. I mean, I guess what, what we are dealing here with is uh, some kind of a proxy decision making, right? I trust the system not because I can interrogate the system, because again, it's only a small group of people who understand how it works. And I can't review the code. I don't understand what is explainable AI, like explainable by whom and to whom, right? So the EU is struggling with uh, identifying what would it mean in practice. And I guess so, so we are due. But um, at the same time, if I trust technology in general, if I have, you know, that this is this is the proxy. If I see technology as a solution to many uh, problems, if I trust the government, if I trust the intentions, I just put all of these factors together, and by proxy, I trust the system. And then on the other hand, if I don't trust technology too much, if I don't trust the government, if 
I have a lot, like see a lot of shady things going on, then I by proxy don't trust the technology. And it's really not about the, the technology itself. So recently there has been more work uh, in, in the field of, you know, acceptance of algorithmic governance that is not only trying to look into the specific uh, specifics of the system, you know, how does the system work? And who can know about it? But looking into the institutional factors of adoption and seeing that uh, they do matter a lot. So we get our information from the context. We get a lot of contextual cues and not the, the, the system specific cues. But the question is whether it is long term sustainable, whether it is, I mean, these things are sort of self, self enforcing, but, but it might, you can imagine that the, the general trust in the situation when nobody understands how the system works. Uh, and and all this trust is based on not reference to the different things which we share. I trust this because I trust that, and that because that because that's something else. And then it's sort of getting circle. It, it it might be possible that it works for some time and then start decaying. And it might be the, the trust well, just the language situation. Yeah, general. you're correct, and and there this is a very interesting thing going on here. So on the one hand. We have, uh, we don't know how the system works, but should we really care if it works? You know, as long as it works, do you really care why and how, right? So th this is one actually quite important question. So if you have something that works, do you care how it actually is done? And a second question here is, and this is in many cases really a case for, let's say, administrative decision making. It's not that we really understand administrative decision making as lay citizens or that we can navigate all these rules without the help of a professional lawyer. So, you know, in, in the case of, you know, being an observer uh, in an election situation, it's maybe actually a situation that has a very low entry barrier. But when it comes to slightly more complex things, let's say welfare allocation decisions, and the intricacy of these decisions, it's not that a, an average citizen understands it's much better and can solve it with a lawyer, without a lawyer. And uh, by analogy, when an algorithm is doing, they need uh, not only a lawyer, but also a coder who explains how the system also works, right? So in a way, in very many situations, we do have to rely on somebody else's expertise because the bureaucratic system is not uh, extremely um, easy to understand. So the red tape concept is there and it, it, it is very often being perceived as not particularly transparent or understandable or self-explanatory. So more comments to the next question. Yeah, related to this is exactly connected on we say not about the public networks. I mean, it tends to be that most of these systems they work by rapidly by 80, 90 percent, and then the last 10 percent or even five percent it takes forever to solve. I put an example: uh, the the self driving cars on on especially trucks they had given up to to do self driving cars inside the cities. They say uh, this five ten percent will be so long to do that they they're not planning to do in the next two three decades probably uh, because um, it, the the consequences of this five percent or ten percent are so dra drastic that um, you better don't do it and and the question is this uh, on on algorithmic governments how. Um, how they will do it in this sense, like uh, probably they will be very, very fast on kind of, it looks like it works, but then in, in a little percentage, uh, it might not work. Like put it in, in, the, in the airport, like I said, I'm an artist and artists, we are very strange people. We always carry very strange things on the luggage and we do very strange things uh, that we fly over the world and do very random moves. Uh, compared to a normal person, person who goes for, I don't know, a vacation travels every six months or, or something. And um, means I, I, even with humans, I tend to have sometimes very kind of tense conversations because like, 
I don't know, they don't understand why I fly over uh, the Atlantic for three days and then I stay in a five-star hotel and and then I carry whatever strange things in my luggage because I have an artwork that requires these things. Uh, means I'm definitely in an outlier of any data set. And and this is this is this is what will happen. Uh, that uh, these outliers will suffer more because I directly will be on the risk factor or any kind of like a strange behavior way. And, and, then, and then we are back to what um, Max was saying, how, um, the, how, how the system and how the, the European Union in this case want to have interfe uh, interface that works for everyone or that works just for the average people, you know, the mean, they call it, no? the, the mean images uh, on, the, on the AI. But kind of the, the kind of the edges of the thing that can be actually very diverse people in, in, in background and so on will match up for at the beginning, especially if this system kind of kind of works but doesn't work. Uh, I mean with, with kind of and, and then that's like enters um, this kind of um, decision to say okay the threshold is 100 percent or it's 95 or it's 80. Um, or, or 75 and, and then, yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think the ETS uh, estimate that the EU is giving is, if I'm not mistaken, but something like 90% or over 90% of uh, all the people who apply for authorization will get an authorization within like a few minutes. So this is their expectation. Uh, but still, even if we're talking 10%, we're talking fat tails, and we know that fat tails is, is a typical property of, uh, of uncertainty, right? And so we actually cannot um, use our typical statistical models uh, and also our um, predictive analytics. It will not work with these uh, fat tails. Uh, so yes, it's definitely a very interesting question, but also it's 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 a great question for um, that that has some, I guess, well, democratic value. What do we want as society? Do we want to automate ninety percent and then only use uh, the the human in the loop for the ten percent, or do we want that human in the loop does hundred percent? And I can't answer you these questions. This is something that needs to be brought to the public, right? First of all, we need to generate a conversation on this because this is inadvertently what where we are going towards. And uh, it's it's a great question that still Langdon Winner was asking, uh, do we really have to always do the technology or uh, should we debate somehow more in the society to which extent, how exactly? But in order to have an informed conversation, we just need more solid research on this topic and we need this conversation openers so that we can start having a, a public discussion and that we can generate some kind of a democratic input so far it's very difficult to do most people have, a... have close to zero idea of uh, what is actually going on and to which extent they are already today being governed by algorithms I would like to boil it down to uh, something um, called common sense, or the German word for it, gesunder Menschenverstand, which means uh, um, healthy human understanding. That's like the term, um, which is interesting because if we talk artificial intelligence, we're always talking about like, oh, can it achieve human level understanding, that kind of stuff, right? But let's for a moment just say, okay, the algorithm uh, in the classical sense, is sort of something that follows some kind of recipe that doesn't need to be implemented in a computer. It can also be implemented in a human. Okay. And, you know, obviously the airport security liturgy, <laughs> which I once compared to sort of like, you know, the transformation uh, of bread to uh, Christ's body and wine into blood in the Catholic Church, because, you know, you can totally walk past the security without anything dangerous. And if you're well trained, you can still kill somebody because you're trained to do so, right? You can use a piece of paper from the airport magazine to cut somebody's throat. It's totally possible. And so this kind of thing is like, obviously, there is some kind of like rationality thing going on. And let me give you an anecdote, which I think can help sort of disambiguate two kind of 
dangers, which I think we should address. So an hour north of Boston, there's a lobster shack called Woodman's, and you have three lines for the mussels, for the beer, and for the lobster. So we have three people, we stand in line. I buy three beers and I pay three beers at the same person. And then the person says, uh, you cannot carry three beers through the restaurant. It's like, why? And she said like, you could give one beer to a child. And it's like, wait, so I could buy one beer and give it to a child, right? And it's like, yeah, but it's the law. So actually it's still the law in this sort of county of Massachusetts that you cannot buy three beers because you could give one to a child. I don't know who came up with this, but these people clearly were drunk or not, or too little, right? So I had a discussion. There were like a hundred people behind me wanted to buy beer. I had like a five minute discussion with this person. I couldn't carry away the beer I just bought from her. At some point, my friend, Gabi, was passing by with three lobsters. And I was like, Gabi, just shut up. Take, Give me a lobster, take a beer. And like we, 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 were all happy. we were all happy. And that's what happened. So we were all happy. So here's the two things. How do we prevent society from suffering from people who have, uh, you know, who fulfill algorithms, which are obviously against common sense, meaning healthy human understanding? And number two, how do we prevent society from people who know how to uh, sort of get around it? Maybe, you know, um, swapping the lobster for a beer, the beer for a lobster. If you're talking high frequency trading, we all know, if you know what kind of beer you need to change for a lobster at like uh, hundreds a second each, you can be very, very rich and pull a lot of money out of public systems, for example. So how do we prevent other people from exploiting the invisible sort of structure of the algorithm, which they know how to exploit. So how do we deal with this? And I think this is, I think, way more profound than talking about artificial intelligence or anything else, because it could be humans. Like, how do we prevent stuff from that, like from happening? What is there, is there some fundamental basic law, like dignity of humans is inviolable, art and science are free, there needs to be common sense, that we need right now to deal with this new situation? Like, do you have any hunch for what is needed? It's a fantastic example that you bring here and you really very vividly describe this profound uh, uh, condition that we are increasingly encountering in our daily lives. I do not have an easy answer to this, uh, but I think reverting around the, the notion of common sense is definitely something is there. And we are back to, to Gerd Gigerenzer and we are back to, this makes a lot of sense. So, you know, the, the biases are not uh, biases in a negative sense. They're actually great tools, great shortcuts because they work in most of the times and sometimes they do mislead us. But uh, what kind of a percentage of accuracy do we actually strive for? What is good enough? Right? But uh, actually, I think that uh, there is a quite a simple answer to your question, which is sort of goes to the to the core of this thing. That actually the, the answer to this is go to the uh, uh, um, law-giving body of the Massachusetts states and change the law. And it is quite a clear route. But if this sort of rule is produced some, in a summer kind way by some trained neural network, you don't know what to do. But he, here you actually, it, it is cumbersome, difficult, and, and uh, may not end up in a success. But, but in principle, at least you understand what to do. Uh, and I wanted, Daria, I wanted to, 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 to get back to one thing which you said like 20 minutes ago, uh, because you, you did make a, a good point, I think, about, about sort of mm, mm, possible equivalence between, between lawyer and uh, computer science specialist needed to, to, to understand things. However, I wanted to, 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 to remark this thing that from my experience, uh, if I have a some sort of a, uh, encounter some sort of a arcane uh, question of law in front of me, we be it electoral law, tax law, administrative law, I can go to 
to well, one or other lawyer I know we talk maybe maybe I understand immediately maybe uh, we will need to talk talks it through for a long time but in the end of the day I understand what's going on when I go to a computer scientist and ask him to explain blockchain I understand literally nothing and I am a person having a PhD in uh, theoretical physics. I dare say that probably general person will be even more biased in this. So, so I'm not sure if it is completely equivalent to one to another. Any answers? Yeah, is he? Evidence. Sorry? Uh, there are so many fascinating research questions that have been now put into the air. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, one of the things that maybe, like, you know, putting some loose ends together here, um, you had this thing with human in the loop. You mentioned that, like, you know, that leads to accountability. Like, one of the interesting things here is this reminds of this other, like, critique of, Taller and Kahneman, which is Nassim Taleb, who said we need skin in the game. Yes. So there's this is connected to this idea of having new emphasis on local government, like you know, sort of like more responsibility by people interacting, which sort of he outlined based on the situation in Lebanon right now. So there, there's basically no central government that really functions. So we need to sort of have some kind of bottom up kind of thing going on. Now, the interesting thing is like if we if you buy what I said at the beginning that like humans are part of the environment and there's uh, input through put output is going we could be the channel, the computer could be the channel, the environment could be the channel. Then this is a rather interesting thing. like what what would be a participatory government of cognitive agents that involve humans and machines? But smells like a local government. Like, like how would how would that look like? Like, like because the, the airport situation you're talking about is a, is a very top down kind of thing. It's like it, the same is true with the police, right? I mean, there's literally one person per country you go to. Similar to the medical industrial complex, you want to have some medical application uh, and some drug approved, you go to one governing body or two or something like that. But but this kind of thing where you know, artificial intelligence is literally everywhere already. It's in these cell phones and cars everywhere. Like, you know, your steering assistance doesn't even need to be self-driving cars. Like, how do we how do we build that and ensure there is a sort of like, um, you know, you, the principles that you're working on are sort of like can be broadly applied. Like, is is there is, is that something? Where would you go to? Like, where, when when you don't talk to airport, but it's like, oh. Can we can we roll this out for an entire population? How can we make them more aware of what goes into that and stuff like that? Like this case, you know, you can go to the governing body. Like, like, like how, how do we do that? Like, how, how do we organize that? That is, I think, a really, really big question. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. what, what does the world look like we want to live in? That is, I think, a really unanswered question that is sort of in your thing in there, isn't it? It is a bit there because so far our attempts to build some kind of participatory digital governance, it has very much boiled down to, oh, we need some kind of a hackathon type of thing where people of different trades can come together and then we design some features that are useful. But that so far didn't really take off. And uh, it may be connected to the fact that uh, we know quite well the letter of political participation. Uh, most people do not want to be actively involved in politics. They want that things uh, function. Uh, mm -hmm. So... We probably should be not too naive to expect that once we have uh, these technical possibilities, everyone will feel like, yes, now I finally can unleash my, you know, inner politician. It's probably not going to happen in exactly in this form. So the format is 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 a great question. So in which format could that then happen? 
But, but isn't it like in an ideal world, there are situations where you don't need to actively be a politician. Like if you, like if you cross the street in, in Boston or in Tallinn, where there is no traffic light, people will consider you a jaywalker which, you know, is sort of like not considered well-educated or like not nice and dangerous, perhaps. While if you do the same thing in Rome, Italy, um, there is a kind of culture that everybody crosses the street wherever they want, and you look the car drivers into the eye and they will stop because there's this mutual respect because they know they are also pedestrians in their neighborhood and they're going to do the same thing. And everybody's sort of fundamentally happy with that. So there is no Britain law, but there is obviously some kind of co-governance emerging. And, you know, I, the governance, co-governance means I just cross the street whenever I want. That is a really interesting thing because these kind of patterns emerging, uh, maybe you need to create the environment where they can emerge. Obviously, they cannot emerge when, you know, sort of like uh, there is a Trump driving by and not taking care, for example. And, and if every car driver has the feeling that it's their right to just go, go ahead straight when they see a pedestrian. And so that is sort of like something where maybe there is a space for people who take the results from your study, who redesign the system, who are not the broad audience, but the broad audience benefits because then they can co-govern without even being politically active by just behaving differently. And so that is sort of something that there, again, I have a, a really neat anecdote, the landscape architect of the 1972 Olympics and the typographer, they did a book in 1983, which you can highly recommend. It's called Die Besitzergreifung des Rasens, The Occupation of the Lawn. So nobody in the English garden in Munich could actually enter the lawn. And they just opened it. That was their one intervention. So everybody could do everything they wanted on the lawn. And then 10 years later, they documented what happened, which is just go there, what makes Munich so awesome. And that is sort of a form of governments where they didn't decide you can do X, you can do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. But they just opened the lawn. It's like, you know, don't do evil stuff. And which reminds us of a certain motto of a certain company, which obviously, you know, has lost that kind of spirit seemingly because... The dynamics of people is different. So the question is, can we get to that? Mm. Back again? Well, the affordances, I guess, are there because uh, there has been theoretical work that shows us that algorithmic governance probably mostly resembles our, some form of governance by design. So that is where we are looking for it. So the, 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 the speed hump. Uh, is a, a very close precursor of algorithmic governance mm -hmm. in this regard. And there are theoretical arguments for this. We don't have time to discuss it now, but uh, I also reference it in my in my work. Uh, so it seems like the, uh, the affordances are there, but now it's just how, how do we get to it? And so far, what we have been observing is that algorithmic governance has had this uh, very weird properties to, on the one hand, uh, have, um, you know, um, being an ex ante type of regulation. So we kind of already define the rules, but then usually when we define the rules, we just have the rules uh, and we cannot trace individuals. So we don't do it on an individual level. We do it on an aggregate level. Here we ha can have rules and personalize them. So it has so far, the implementation has been hierarchy individualized or like personalized, uh, which is a fundamentally scary way of doing it. But so the question is, what else uh, can it be deployed for? We discussed for, you gave a talk, we discussed in total for two hours. This was supremely inspiring, at least to me, and I hope everybody else agrees. Um, so thank you very much. Um, very, very awesome. So uh, good luck and uh, all the success that is possible with the ERC funding. We're totally looking forward to what you find out. Thanks a thank lot for inviting me. It was fabulous to discuss with you. And uh, please do invite me again in uh, four to five years time. We nice. talk again. Okay. I would love to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Rihanna, see you next week. Bye-bye.